Okay, so let's take a look at this. Now, between these two scenes, this would make more sense if the rest of the stopwatch moved up while the center part was dropping down. That hard cut is jarring, like I showed you a few weeks ago when we went over this. But I love how you've applied texture and you parented the texture and it's all staying together. That's very nice. There's a little bit of squash and stretch on the impact, but I don't know if it's behaving properly or on the way up. At least you got it on the way down. It looks like it's stretching before it even hits the air. So maybe those keyframes are a little bit off. This is the fast way of mocking up something. Uh, I'm just going to put an adjustment layer and a transform effect because I don't know what layers are here and I just want to take a look at what it would look like if we adjusted the timing of this. So quick reminder, adjustment layers will affect everything below them in the layer stack. And I'm reading Eric's thing in the chat real fast. Yes, there will be a refresher Wednesday. Uh, before we all leave tonight, I'm going to test out that link um, that I was emailed ages ago and make sure that that works properly for us to review everybody's work. I'm liking the uh, life you have to the ball there. So I'm going to animate the scale and the position in the transform effect I put on the adjustment layer because that is going to affect every layer below it. So it's like dumbing up a fake camera without having to figure out all these layers in this project. Now, do you see the difference between this quick thing, Danielle, where we're staying almost, you know, I just eyeballed it, but we're staying tight in and then there's a slow zoom out reveal. And obviously don't forget, uh, what's it called? Easy, easier keyframes. See the difference that makes? Yeah, and uh, let's take a look. And like I said, I dummied that up with an adjustment layer and the transform effect. Because remember, every layer has the transform abilities and there's the four pillars of motion design, position, scale, rotation, and opacity. So the fast cheat for that was, like I said, throwing the transform effect on the adjustment layer to affect every layer below it. Now let's take a look at your squash and stretch. And I mentioned this last week, a fast way of finding your way around someone else's project is look at where your playhead is and then any layers that are under that playhead are relevant. Like this one right over here does not apply because if my playhead's right here and that layer's there, I know it has nothing to do with that. So I'm gonna hit the U key here. And yep, that looks like where our squash and stretch is at. And don't forget, you can zoom in and out of your timeline with your little magnification uh, icon there. So remember, every keyframe has a lot of information. And we can tell, let me zoom in, because Adobe should make everything in After Effects and Premiere a whole lot smaller because my eyesight is so great and it's just too easy to work and I think they need to shrink everything down. Danielle's square, the uh, ball that's rolling around, is 463 by 463. So we'll go keep that in mind when she's doing her squash and stretch. And here you can see where it's squashing and stretching and then going back to its normal. So 463 by 463 is the size when it's not squashing and stretching. So I'm just gonna go from keyframe to keyframe by hitting the previous and next. And here, right here, it's stretching before it's even in the air. So what we could do is we could say, all right, let's have it start stretching here. Slide that keyframe over. But remember, this keyframe's all the way over here. If we don't want the stretch to happen here and there shouldn't be a change, you can just slide that one over rather than make your life difficult. So see, now it's staying at its circular size, then it's starting to stretch in the air. And see right here, it's returning 
to, well, it should be right about here. Oh, okay. All right. Now, here's an interesting thing. Right before it reaches its apex, it should be uh, circle again. So see that little bit? And then you're going to need, so that's the stretch. Stretch is up and in. As we saw here, she went up 50 and in 50 because you want to keep the volume. That's the right way to do it. Great job listening, Danielle. Now it's going to need to stretch again on its way down because of the earth, the gravity of the earth. So just before there, it'll have its greatest stretch, which was up 50 and in 50. So that was 463, that's 513. And this should be 463, that should be 413. So up 50, in 50, anchor point at the bottom because that's where the gravity is pulling it. Superb. And right about here, we're going to have it keep its circle. So that's 463 by 463. Because the gravity won't be kicking in until right about there, then there's your squash and stretch on the bounce. So it's stretch, stretch, squash. Nice. And we touched up this part with just a simple now why is this looking the way it's looking oh you know why because you've probably got uh texture and i zoomed in so much that's what's going on there it's just increasing that texture a bit not a problem and i'll go through a little bit more and take a look at it more critically and we already talked about this part where that part should go up and the other part should go down right he here that's a little bit too jarring like as that's falling the other part can be going up that'll help sell that transition too i got you no that's the smart way to work okay so there's your stopwatch pre-composed just like you promised now let's go back here and see here is where your overlap is at. So we've got the playhead right here and it's going to say where we are right here inside the comp, the pre-comp. This is what's going to be going down and everything else should be going up. So let's move see how far is this move the drop down is to there right before there so that's four two two one let's go into the pre-comp And you could just fix the timing of this between these two. Let's see, which one's the one that I moved? Okay, so mine is a little bit before yours. I like the squash and stretch on it. Oh, you know what? I've got a better idea. Watch this. You ready? Here's the fast fix, because I'm feeling lazy tonight. It's all about being lazy. Ready for this? I'm holding down Alt, clicking the P next to the bracket, and I'm trimming that ball. I've just got to trim it a little bit earlier. And that is still going on a little too early okay let me turn a little bit more that 
that's just your layer blending going on right there. So see how that fixes that one scene up into the transition a bit nicer? Were there any other parts you were thinking of uh, pushing further or you had some questions on? So right now it's looking pretty solid. Um, you might want to add a little bit of life into the text. And like I said, you could do that just by finding some fun textures and bright colors and doing um, toggle hold frame changes to them. Or even just having the layers live for one or two um, frames. Are you familiar with toggle hold keyframes? for animating fills and things like that. Some bounce will be nice, but also a lot of life inside them. Let's take a look at your type. Okay, so there's your text, which means it's probably pre-composed, which is good, because that also means you could treat it as an alpha mat. Meaning, so we're right here, right about here. And since I have my adjustment layer, that'll also animate with it. But let's go to about here. And I'm going to bring in a texture. One second, let me hit save. Or you know, actually, no, wait, let's try this. You could put a fill effect on this and use a mask if you wanted to on the adjustment layer. Like, uh, I could throw the effect here, see how that's going to affect every layer below it, but I'm just going to put on your pre-comp for now. And I'm going to... Let's see what color was it before. Okay, so was that? And so we'll do this. And this is where you use toggle hold and you could go a couple frames change the color to whatever you want. And since you're using blending modes, you're gonna get some weird fun results with that. So it looks like the brighter the text. Okay, that's because of the blending mode. Okay, so you're not gonna get too much there, but see how you get the quick changes? That's how toggle holds work. I'm gonna take that effect off. Now, if you're gonna do something with textures, and this adjustment layer. I mean, not the adjustment layer, the um, alpha mat we could use from this. So I can throw some textures I have on my computer and I'm going to hold down alt, alt or option, hit the bracket next to the letter P, go forward a few frames, hit alt or option and the bracket two away. So that's only living a short amount of time. And what I'll do is I'll choose alpha mat for the, you could even have it go the whole thing if you want. That's your call as the designer, but see how it's keeping the background consistent and the texture is now in there. And then I could just split this again if I want to. And use it as an alpha mat for another thing that below there. Scale it up a little bit. Again, trim the layer with the Alt or Option. Have a few frames. Set that with an alpha mat, the type above it. See how you get those quick type of uh, textures. And then, you know, I gotta split this again. And then you can put another texture below. But that's how you can get some fast, frantic type changes and textures and add a little bit more life to it along with the bouncing. And if you had the type bouncing, all these textures would still work because that's pre-composed. That and then this one. What I'm going to duplicate it and put it below all of them and spread it out so that I don't have to worry about if any of my stuff doesn't line up. See? 
now that one that I put below fills in the gaps. So let's drag our render bars. Trim that. To the edge of that layer. So then you can see the one below it again. And I had to turn on the eyeball icon for it. That's why it wasn't appearing. So now I'll see what that looks like. See that? That's a little bit more energy and life and interest to it. And we're keeping those textures inside the type. And if you wanted, you could change the background texture in the same fashion with a different contrasting texture to get some more punch to this. Those are just a few ways of pushing this a little further. Okay, so as I've said, one thing that could push this quickly is something triggering the, uh, well, what's going on there? That's wild. Did you see that? The second hand went off a little early, but that's fine. That's just something to look out for. See where that happened. And you precompose this obviously. This was trimmed before that. Let's take a look. See, that's why I rename my file so I don't damage anything. That's what it was. One of the keyframes was moved too far apart. And there's a little blending mode thing there with it too. Of these extra layers above it probably. It was just the overlapping layers that caused that. See now it's moving all together again. If you want to push this, maybe some dust or little pebbles coming out from the impact as um, particles. You could maybe even add some motion lines to make it look like it's going further. And that would just be, I've got no layers selected. Like that, no fill. I'm just picking a random color here. Well, let's just do black. And clearly this should go under the ball, but uh, this would be a trim path. You'd want it to line up with the ball. You see how that's going, and then it would chase itself off by animating the other stopwatch. Line this up with the ball a little bit better. Just give you a rough idea. There we go, that's better. Let's line up with the ball. Then you use blending mode on that. Let's see where your ball went.
and I could move this forward a frame so it's a little bit further behind it. And then it's getting a little, little bit ahead of it. So I'm gonna drag these out a little bit. See like that, add a little bit of life to it. And obviously it would end a little bit better, but I'm just putting it in there for reference for you. Don't forget to ease your keyframes. Let's say we're all done with this and we say, yeah, sure, this is fine. Make sure you've got the right sequence selected in the timeline. Because the one that's selected is the one that's going to render. This is the one I want to render. I go composition, add to Adobe encoder. I'm going to open it up down here first because it takes a little bit to load up. Okay, so I have it loaded up here. So I'm going to go composition. Remember, you're, you have the right sequence selected. Composition, add to Adobe Media Encoder. And then I'll show you how to use the render engine in a moment in case you can't get encoder to work. So once it's there, you see it line up right here. H.264 is the file format you're going to want because it's a little bit compressed, but not overly compressed. The default is a high bit rate and we covered compression last time. So it's gonna look pretty decent. And then right here is where you name the file and choose where to save it. So I'm gonna save it to the desktop. I'll just call it stopwatch, why not? And then hit save. So once you've got the right compressor, which is H.264, you're sure you're on a high bit rate. You already clicked what you wanna call it and where you want it to go. The last thing is to click this green arrow up here in the corner. And depending upon the complexity of your project will determine how long it takes to render. Uh, my computer is fairly fast. So you see right here, time remaining about eight seconds. And all your information is down here. It's 1920 by 1080, 24 frames, which is correct. H.264, high bit rate. And it failed. Why wouldn't it fail? After X, that's how you would have rendered it. Let's clear out everything, see what happens then. H.264, high bit rate. That's correct. You don't need to go into this section. I'm just checking it out on my own. Let's drop it down to five for the fun of it. Cause I'm a fun guy. Uh, da, 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 I'm sure. You know what? Let's not save it to the desktop. Because we did that last, so always try something different. I'll save it here. Click OK, and we'll see what happens. And then you hit the green arrow. This is where it's hanging up right here. It's right where the this part is. And that's where we're seeing this drop in quality as well. That was the frame that was tripping us up. So I'm going to go to just before it and see if it'll render. You know what? No. Okay, so if that worked, that would have been how you do it. I'm going to show you how to do render queue. So I'm going to add to render queue. I do not want lossless. That would be enormous. I'm going to choose QuickTime. In my format options, see what we've got. I'll do animation, quality, oh, that's really high quality, but who cares? It's going to be a massive file. If you wanted render with alpha, that'd be right here. Okay, and I'll just hit OK. I'll call that stopwatch.movie, and I'll save that to my work in progress. We'll see what happens here. See, that one worked. Oops, sorry about that. So, the render queue was able to do it. It's sort of like working on a Photoshop 
like a layered Photoshop file. Uh, it's the most robust, but it's going to be an enormous file. It must have been something with the... with the textures and the ex um, adjustment layer. I don't know why that would cause a disruption, and we're not even working at 32 bits, but that is an example of how to render with both Adobe Media Encoder as well as the Adobe Render Engine. And what I did here was I did a one point track with the tracker. I tracked just the motion and I picked a spot on each one. I picked a spot on each one of the lights, the cameras, and I just duplicated the video clip. So each time it only had one track in it just to have some ease of mind. And then I parented the null to that track point. Then I parented the text to the null. So this is parented to that, that's parented to that, that's parented to that, and that's parented to that. That's how you get the type to move with the camera. And here is an example. Um, let me open up my sequences. I started off with a bunch of shape layers and I put the cut paper texture in them and used the shapes as an alpha mat and then parented the texture to the shapes so that it, you know, moves the way it should. And it started off with person walking. That was the first thing I needed. And remember, if you duplicate a pre-comp in the timeline and change it, you're going to affect the original pre-comp. So I duplicated that in the project panel. So I had someone walking, then I need someone mowing a lawn. So I renamed, I duplicated and renamed it from walker to mower. And then, uh, you can see the bars right there of the lawnmower when I adjust that. So now I have that original motion, but I didn't need the arms moving because they're holding the mower and the mower is parented to the torso. And that's how I save time on that animation. And of course, I squashed and stretched the torso on all these people who are walking to get that uh, natural bounce and spring in their step that affects the rest of the animation of the body that everything's parented to. That's pretty useful. So I'm being sarcastic there. Now, if I like this tone, but I like all that fractal texture, I can try and mess around in here. So that's what's controlling that, the contrast right there. Now I'm just darkening the texture below so it appears more through the alpha mat. But you can see how I took this prefabricated animation and I made it more my own just by messing around some of the parameters.
I was actually not expecting that to happen when I put it on this layer. That's what the effect does on a full layer as opposed to a uh, moving path. I like how I can see the new cloud. It's taller and has a more distinct shape than the other ones. And I can see the bird wings flapping. And the sand looks really good at this high resolution. I like the uh, texture on it. I'm going to drop down the resolution because we see the good detail there. Well, if you want to add a little more life to this, I mean, the clouds casting shadows. Yeah, there's the hair. And remember, uh, the shadow should be larger than what it is because of how it's casting. Oh, here comes the particles. I think the problem with the hair is tonally, it's so close to the ground. You know, like maybe if the hair were, but then again, that's what it would be in nature. It'd be camouflage, but uh. Now, one thing that's really going to add to this is sporadically adding like a name or two at different parts of the screen, like maybe one over towards the left went over towards the right, like very stepped out. But you gotta watch that. It's got enough time to be read on the screen. And that'll help add something to this title slash credit sequence. You really wanna add some depth to this? Uh, gradate the sky. Cause that flat color, um, if you put some tone to it, it'll really help everything else pop cause you're adding more value to it. Whereas parts of this will be a little too close to some of those other things. Putting a gradient and more contrast in the sky will definitely help separate everything in the scene. But it's coming along nicely. And once you 3D enable it, clearly it'll move with your camera. So that shows have a type move with it just make sure you anchor it to something like visually so it makes sense and the viewer has enough time to read it and as i was saying so here's the name and i was commenting if you added some texture to it so if i go file import file this is pretty easy to see uh, this texture right here so I'll put it below, because remember, the mask goes over your face. I'll scale this down a little bit and position the texture where it looks best with the type I've got. There. Wait a second. Almost forgot. Make the texture 3D. And then let's shrink that down. First, let me turn off the alpha mat. So first, I got the texture 3D. Let's put the type back on. So I can line this back up. Yep, little by little, that's what it's all about. Okay, so now this text and the texture are both 3D. Let's double check. Yep, they're 3D. So now I go back to my switches. Now, I set the alpha map below and now I can position the texture 
so it looks its best. Let's just say that that's where we want it. Now I'm going to pick whip parent the texture to the text, make sure everything stays together. And if I want, lastly, I can tint or fill this. If I give it a fill, it'll fill in with the whole color. That's not what I want. So I'm going to do tint so it'll keep this nice texture, but also add a little bit of color to it. Or I could do uh, colorama or tritone. I'm going to do colorama just for the fun of it. See how it does with this. Uh, no, no, let's do tint. So there's not enough of a gradient to it. So I changed the white. Let's make it a little more like the brown we see there. Oh wait, I gotta put the tint not on the text, but on the texture because we're using the text as an alpha mat. There we go. And from here, I can determine if I want it to be brighter or darker to help it stand out the scene a bit more. But you see how that adds in, and you can put a second line like, you know, as the sheriff you would need that to it at least so let's and this can be a lot smaller because it's not as important as the actor that and this will have the texture and the tint to it as well because it's still the same line of copy like such and then you could just duplicate all that and um that's a great particle by the way looks really good let's see it on uh very nice job nice depth to it that's showing a lot of applied knowledge and pushing what you've learned And you and uh, Jack love your little vaporwave stuff there, don't you? How many pieces is this arm? Is this one, two, three pieces? Yep, okay, good. Position of rotation, nice. I see you're using that as a fly through. This glow. Okay, so you did this in. Okay, I, 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 I see what you did there. Now let's see something real fast. Let's see what happens if we throw a glow on your fake glow. Just for the fun of it. I cranked your bit depth up to 32. Let me double check on that. Bits per channel down here, right by the trash can. You hold down Alt or option when you click on it to go from 8 to 16 to 32 bit. Now let's see something. See how now you've got some options with animating that as well, should you want to. Now see right here is where I animated in the glow. add a little bit of life to that without changing any of your artwork.
So you could change that however you want if you feel like adding one. I'm just showing you that option. All I did was I animated the threshold, the radius, and the intensity. And you can get a variety of looks. And there's your thing you're doing right there. And like I said, the glow would play off and enhance that at the same time. You did a great job on your multi-angle character. If you want to make this pop, rather than do that um, big fight scene you're talking about, here's how you do it. So here's a way of going from scene to scene and tying it all together. See how you got these grids here? What if those grids distorted to be in this perspective over time and then the lines faded out with this coming in. Yeah, like that. So it's like, um, let me show you something real fast. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. Isn't that a great song I just made up? You wouldn't know it, but I just made it up right now. Okay, that's her. We don't need that. Okay, there we go. All right, so check this out. I'm going to show you something. What you've got here is grayscale. So it's not only shapes, it's tone, which works to your benefit. Oh, don't fall asleep on me. I don't know what's going on with that other computer. All right, so I'm going to just dummy this up real quick for you. So I'm making a new solid. And black, I don't know why I chose black. I shouldn't have because I'm putting a grid down. Now I'm a clown for doing that. Oh, nope. There we go. All right, so... Let's make the grid like a purplish color like you sort of had. I'm just going by ear here. Let's see. Your lines were a little thicker, so I'm just going to dummy this up like this. And I'm going to make this grid layer that I just did 3D enable right there. Which means now I can spin on the Y axis should I want to. And I think I want to. So let me hold down Shift and hit P because remember, if I hit R, that's going to just show my rotation. But if I hold down Shift and hit P, that'll also bring up the position, which is right over here. And then I can move it closer and further in Z space should I need to. And I can see my rotations off a little bit. So you just find the axis for it. Well, like I said, you do it in Illustrator, but you could also do it here. I'm going to move my anchor point to the bottom corner just so I can scale out more easily. Like that. Okay, good. Here's my grid and here's the image below it. Let me put that down. When you've got tone, you can do a uh, gradient transition which is called, bu, 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 bum, I think it's gradient wipe. I'm going to put it on here because this has more tone. And look at that. Boom. Instant interest. And you could adjust the softness should you choose to. Like that. So I'm going to do this put this here click on the transition there move forward a little bit keyframe that transition hit the U key so you can see where that's at and you could always speed that up or slow it down by moving those further apart and then as these characters come in let's see what happens if I put the grid below it Now it's going to fill over the grid. See that? And then if you want to get super fancy, if this is its own layer, you could use that as an alpha mat and cut it out. Or, you know, once you've got enough of it filled in, you could start to fade out the grid. Like such, with the good old-fashioned thing of a thing. The opacity. Boom. Done and done. See how that looks. Yep. Boom. What do you think of that? 
that help bring in that scene a little bit better? Okay, I'm going to give you this file for reference. Another thing is with these characters, if you could have them have a little bit of life, like if her arms were just bending a little bit by the elbow and the hair were swaying a little bit and like her leg were, you know, just a little bit of subtle life, that's really going to help with this. And you might also want to consider some shadows to help anchor them into the scene. But I'm really liking this. I mean, there's just so much good stuff going in it. And let me see what we got here. This is important. Don't forget, continuously rasterize your Illustrator files, okay? Make sure you do that so you keep the quality of them. Because it is good work and I want it to look its best. So you just make sure you do that. And you could, instead of the wipe happening, you could have your logo hero text come up here, keeping them all on the screen as well. And that'll be much more visually interesting than, um, you know, doing the black wipe revealing the type. So that would be my two cents there. And you did a really smart thing having so much tone to these buildings because like some of them are darker, some of them are lighter. You got the gradient in the street and you can see why you can play off of tone with your animation and transitions as well as the shapes. So that's all about tying it all together. Any final questions from anyone before I head out? If not, I hope everyone has a great night. I'll see you Wednesday. And we'll render out all the projects by the end of lab. And then have the crit on Thursday using uh, discussions through Canvas. If that doesn't work, we'll do an unlisted stream on my YouTube channel. Stay safe. Have a great night. And I will see everybody Wednesday. If you have any questions or concerns, just email me before class Wednesday and I'll try and reach out to you. Thanks. And have a great evening.